Good evening. My name is Carol Gerstein, and you've tuned into Carol Gerstein Invites, hosted by the Kronberg Academy. And we are in a virtual space with um, cellist and author Elizabeth Wilson. I'm 
in Osaka in Japan right now. Elizabeth is in beautiful Italy and you have tuned in from all over the world, which I'm very grateful for. And I think we have a very interesting session in front of us um, because Elizabeth kindly has agreed to speak about the subject of her upcoming book for which I think um, we can hardly wait. And that is um, the great Russian pianist and really a grand personality, of course, a great musician, Maria Yudina. And there's much to learn about her. You just heard her play uh, very beautifully the uh, rather unknown uh, album Leaf by Mussorgsky, another maverick in the, in the Russian cultural scene of a slightly earlier era. And um, I think we'll learn a lot about uh, Maria Yudina and about Russian culture, Russian history, Soviet history, and um, Elizabeth is uniquely uh, positioned to, to speak about, uh, about these things, uh, having studied in Russia, written about um, Shostakovich, Rostropovich, uh, wonderful books. And um, so without wasting more time, welcome Elizabeth, wonderful to have you here. Uh, and um, let's let's talk about let's talk about you, Dina. Well, thank you, Kirill. It's wonderful for me to be here and fantastic because I got rid of my manuscript. I delivered it the day before yesterday. <laughs> so it's nice to talk and not have to sit there thinking, what have I forgotten to write? Um, and you can ask me questions to to jog my memory. I wanted to mention um, we just listened to this rather unusual. Mussorgsky piece and I think one of the reasons Yudina got interested in this was that during the Second World War she was a kind of patriotic duty she was stayed in Moscow many musicians were evacuated and she worked at the radio and sometimes in a month she would make seven or eight recordings a lot of recordings particularly at the beginning and her name was known throughout the Soviet Union and she got letters from uh, soldiers at the front and people in exile in far off Siberia. Um, she brought comfort to people. Now, one of the things was that the radio programs had to fit into slots that were not more than 20 minutes or not more than 10 minutes or nine and a half minutes. So she wanted to play a lot of patriotic music and she maybe looked up and found these pieces by Mussorgsky and she also played the Borodin Little Suite which are not works that you usually find in a pianist program or indeed in her programs because she loved playing very big works, sort of monumental works. Um, so wh what a wonderful discovery it was to find these miniatures, absolutely beautiful pieces. Yes, but uh, let's, um, let's start from the beginning because I think um, some in our audience know you Dina very well, are very familiar some know that she is, let's say, one of the so-called historical pianists that one should know. Um, and some people might be uh, very new to Yudina. So mm -hmm. I think if you um, refresh our memory with, um, with some, let's say, basics about, about uh, her origins. Um, she was born in 1899 in a small town in the settlement, uh, the Pale, the Jewish population of the town's called Nevil. And to put it on the map today, it's on the, literally on the border with Belarus, with Belarusia, and quite near Vitebsk, which is a more important town. And that's where she had her first piano lesson. It's about, I can't remember, it's something like under 100 kilometers from Vitebsk to, to Nevil. And it took her about four hours in the train, in the fast train, to get there. And she'd stay overnight. And she had lessons on the piano with a rather remarkable pianist who had studied with Rubinstein, and had got married and became a piano teacher. Gave up performing, and she was very, very um, talented. Everybody saw that. And at the age of thirteen, she was taken to St. Petersburg, and she enrolled at the conservatoire with um, the famous Anna. Yesipova, who was um, kind of a myth in the world of piano playing, and she was a 
teacher of many famous pianists, including Prokofiev um, and others. And she was the wife of, let me get it right, um, Theodor Lysitsky. First the student, then the wife. As uh... Yeah, exactly. And his assistant. So she was a highly experienced, uh, very severe and strict, apparently. But um, anyway, Yudina didn't have long with her because she then died um, prematurely. And she then went on to another teacher who was Vladimir Drozdov. And at the same time, she started having kind of private secret lessons with Blumenfeld, who was an immense influence on her and a very, very important uh, um, pianist. An uncle, and so, uh, uncle of Horowitz, no, if I'm... I'm not mistaken. He's definitely uncle. He was a cousin of, um, he was a teacher of Horowitz. I don't know that he was an uncle of his, but I, he was I, related I, to Neuhaus. But that's not important. But teacher, yeah. Heinrich Neuhaus was his cousin, I think, then. And Shimanovsky, they were all a kind of, um, because they came basically from Ukraine and the, Poland, it was all, so those families were um, together. Anyway, Yudina. Uh, um, studied and at the age of 17, um, we all remember what happened in that year, 1917. Um, the first revolution was the February Red Revolution and Yudina kind of joined in the fun and became uh, part of the militia. And um, she was studying at the Lesgaft Institute, which is a very interesting thing because in Russia at the time, uh, there were no universities for women. So they had special courses for women and the Bistuzhov Institute and the Leskaft Institute. But Leskaft originally wanted to do phys physkultura, uh, gymnastics, and he had a whole thing. And then he had courses for um, people who are going to be preschool teachers. So she did one of these courses. And then she started getting problems with her arms and very, very sore, and she couldn't play. So she went back to Neville, and there, by complete chance, um, moved the country's most famous philosophers. And they, they um, and I think we have Matteo, Ma, not Matteo, but uh, um, uh, Kagan, who was a pupil of, um, wait a minute, let me get this right. He, he studied in Germany and the, the, at the Neo-Kantian school. And he was already there. He'd come back because of the war. And suddenly arrived um, Mikhail Bakhtin, who is probably the most well-known philosopher and literary uh, critic of the um, 19th, of our 20th century. Now, he formed a philosophical uh, circle in Neville. And Yudina joined in, they became very close friends. And there was a third important influence, um, Lev Pumpiansky, who was another literary critic. And they and several others formed this circle. And so suddenly Neville, which was important because it was away from the cities, it had enough food, it had accommodation, and they could all spend their time talking about philosophy. So that was one part of her life. She went back to St. Petersburg, Petrograd, of course, we should call it. Um, and she entered the university to study philosoph philosophy, philosophy and um, medieval history was her other subject. So she did this kind of on the side. And gradually, she got the use of her hands back. Um, because she had this problem throughout her life of having kind of a form of rheumatoid arthritis, I think it was. And every now and then she would fall ill and she couldn't play and she had terrible swellings of her hands and legs and it was a perennial problem and she managed to get through life and still be a great pianist, notwithstanding the problem. Um, so, blessing in disguise that for that particular period that she got to be exposed to, to, to especially to Bachtin, it seems from yes. consequence. Oh. That. Bakhtin and the wonderful uh, uh, intellectual life that Petrograd University had at the time. And there were many wonderful professors, but um, she always remembered in particular Karsavin, Lev Karsavin, um, now, um, who 
was a pupil of Ivan Graves, who was the most important historian of the time. Um, they, they were all um, amazing people. And of course, what was happening in Russia was that after the revolution, we then had the civil war. And Lenin, first of all, had to get rid of all the opposition. And after he got rid of the opposition and they had the, the Bolsheviks had won the civil war, the next stage was to get rid of the intellectuals, if you are, people who could become opposition. And there was a famous uh, philosopher's steamer, which in 1922, they arrested almost, you know, kind of hundreds of intellectuals and philosophers and historians and other people. And they packed them onto a boat and sent them off to Germany. So if you like, it was quite, relatively speaking, um, <laughs> better than being sent into the gulag in, um, and into the terrible concentration camps that they then developed. Uh, the first one being in Solovki, the island monastery in the north, in the middle of the White Sea. Um, and so one of the first concentration camps in the world, I think, I don't know, maybe there were other ones earlier in. Yes, not the, kind of of that you want to, not the kind of claim to fame one would wish for, but unfortunately. Yes. Well, unfortunately, yes, a lot of wonderful people ended up there. Some of them survived, some of them didn't. Um, of course, Yudina, in the meantime, then in 1920, 21, she went back to the conservatoire to finish her musical studies. And her musical studies, I should say, were not just piano, but she learned conducting and percussion with uh, Nikolai Cherepnin. She loved playing the timpani in the student orchestra. And I think you can hear that when you hear how she plays basses in the piano. <laughs> I always hear her playing the timpani. Um, and uh, what else can I tell you about her? Um, well, she entered into Nikolaev's class, Leonid Nikolaev, who was a wonderful teacher. He was a composer himself, but a wonderful pianist. And he had a remarkable class. Teacher of self yeah, yes, Dmitry Shostakovich was a fellow student, although much several years younger than Yudina. And Vladimir Sofrenitsky, another incredible mythical pianist, was also in the class. And, and there at a, there, there's a fantastic quote from Shostakovich, no, about uh, how he says that he, uh, when he studied, he kind of wanted to imitate everything that Yudina did playing wise. Yes, that's true. Um, I think there's several. One thing that Nikolaev said, listen to how Marussia plays Bach. You can hear every voice. And he said that it was true. You could hear every voice. And then, um, yes, you're quite right. He said um, she, she was wonderful and I wanted to copy her because she was a mature artist. But then I realized it didn't make sense because you can copy like a photograph. You can copy something. And, but you can't copy what motivates the way it's played, the kind of inner impetus. And that is impossible to copy. You have to feel it yourself. So I realized it was um, a no-go. And he would often ask her, he said, why do you play it like this? Um, because it, she, she didn't always follow the indications in the score. And she would say, well, I feel it like that. Or I think it should be like that. And she had enough... Um, how shall I say, she had enough security, enough uh, conviction to be able to make it work. But I, I, I wouldn't, he, again, he didn't think it was a good idea to copy. And I'm sh I don't know that you would say to your students, um, listen to Yudina, but copy her or don't copy her. I don't know what you'd say. Well, I think Shostakovich was, was far too talented to simply, so to simply copy. And I think we'll, we'll get to this. I, I want to hear how you feel um, Eudinus, uh playing, but my impression is that with her, perhaps with all artists, but since she is such a rich personality and there's so much spirituality and religious belief and philosophy um, in her difficult fate, that I think one has to consider the playing sort of complete with the, with the person. It's a uh, some things are abstractly wonderful and beautiful, but even the things that one can say, well, is she following the letter of the score or not? But um, it really comes as this person of flesh and bone and incredible conviction and um, 
independence of thought. Obviously, she didn't follow the letter of the score, but the spirit, maybe, yes, the spirit. Oh, is everybody's there. still trying to find uh, out what the letter of the score but, is anyway, so might yeah, as well. But <laughs> we won't go into that. But I should, you mentioned her being religious, and that, of course, was a very important part of her life because when she was 19, just before her 20th birthday, she converted to um, uh, Russian Orthodoxy. She was baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church. And she took her duties as a Russian Orthodox very seriously. Um, and she sang in church choirs and she visited services and she wanted to live in the Christian spirit of living her life for other people and doing good um, in as many ways as possible. Um, it's rather extraordinary because her life was sort of divided into three aspects. She had the musical one, when she started giving concerts, of course, very early, she made her debut in 1922 with, um, uh, or 1920, even 1921 with um, Cooper, the conductor, um, who was the head of the St. Petersburg, uh, I should call it the Petrograd Philharmonic. And she opened the very first season of the Petrograd Philharmonic, the new orchestra made after the um, revolution playing Beethoven's Emperor Concerto. And on that day, it was the day um, of Alexander Bloch's funeral. And she said, we should never have played. We should have, we should have, you know, what an enormous event that was, this great poet who represented the, uh, and was loved by the whole of the Russian, well, intelligentsia, not, but not only, it's an enormous figure. And Had she time, she, uh, did she have time to meet him also? Did she know him personally or? I don't think so. I don't think so. She, she met many, many poets, but I don't think she met Bloch personally, but she will have known many people who did. And it's quite possible she did meet him because she belonged to two important philosophical societies. One was called Volfila or the kind of liberal philosophical society. And the other was called Voskresenia, which in Russia has a double significance. It means Sunday, and it also means resurrection. Um, and I think these circles were incredibly important for Yudina, but also for many of the intellectuals. An incredible amount of people, interesting people belonged. And Bloch certainly came to give lectures at Volfila. So it's possible she met him. I, I, I have no, didn't find any record of it. Um, and, but um, and we have to remember she came from a, a religious, an anti-religious background because her father and her family were agnostic Jews. They didn't, um, Neville was full of synagogues and practicing Jews and Yiddish was spoken a lot. And Yudina had this thing that she loved this part of her background, the Jewish part. And she never negated it, but she, by belief she was a Christian. And her father was furious. He didn't at all approve. He hated priests, he hated rabbis, he hated anybody who was religious. And he was a doctor and a, a man who did a lot for social well-being of his town, building hospitals and things like that. And um, he could never quite come to terms with his daughter for what for her going off with priests. As he and um, and the, the priest that was so important in her, her life, this, is, this was uh, uh, Piotr, was it Florensky or am I confusing? Lord, yes, Father Pavel Florensky. Pavel Florensky. And uh, did she meet him uh, already yeah. at the time of her conversion to... Uh, no, no. Um, she... It's a complicated story and I don't want to go into it too much, but basically um, because the Bolsheviks were trying to infiltrate the church they, and trying to make life very difficult for the church, they, um, when the patriarch died in 1925, they uh, put in his place, they put somebody who was, if you like, one of their men, they wanted to have it. And what happened, there was a split in the church, there was a schism. And the most, a lot of people were very upset and they thought that the church 
you know, shouldn't be interfered with and it shouldn't become an instrument of Soviet power, which is what the Bolsheviks wanted it to be. So there was a very important split in Leningrad, uh, as Petrograd has now become. And there was a priest called Fyodor Andreev who led the so-called, um, well, we call them in English, Josephites, and I think Yosif Liani in Russian. Anyway, it was an important split. Um, and Yudina belonged to them. So what happened was when um, uh, this was in 19, 1927, she met um, Andreev, Fyodor Andreev. He became her confessor. And through him, she met Florensky. And Florensky is one of the most remarkable figures, not only in Russia, anywhere. He was considered kind of Leonardo da Vinci of the Russia, the Soviet Union. He was. It appears we lost Elizabeth for hopefully a second. She uh, she did warn me about this because um, we right now have uh, lockdown everywhere, as you know, and uh, and uh, the internet in the more rural part of Italy. Uh, oh, and I we lost you a little bit, but I explained about the internet and the lockdown in the in, in the. Yes. It's good that you didn't leave us for long. You were talking about Florensky, and I think um, I will post a link to to him, so those of you that are interested uh, can yeah. read more about him. And I think uh, about Bakhtin would be also very interesting to hear from. Yeah. Um, though we sidetrack from you, Dina, for for a little bit. Uh, am I on in my voice there too? Your voice was was perfect. Your picture was stuck for a little while, but now you're moving, and we can hear you very well. Good. Okay. Uh, just I'll try and be brief about Florensky, but he, he was an incredible scientist. He was an art historian. He was um, a mathematician. He was a religious philosopher. Um, he was quite a good musician, and he and Eugenia would meet and play Mozart for hand music and they would talk about everything under the sun. Um, now, Florensky was an exception. He was a priest and he would go and work for the pet project of Lenin was the electrification of the country. They used to say communism, communism is electrification of the country plus socialism. So, and of course, and, and we, we all still remember <laughs> the uh, uh, Lenin's lamp, the Lenin's light bulb, Lampochka Ilicha. Lampochka, exactly. <laughs> that is, um, anyway, there was Florensky working on that. And not only did he work on this project, he actually um, laid down, I think, 10 patents for the Soviet Union. You know, very important. Um, in the meantime, he was also teaching uh, at the art school. Um, it was called. And apart from him, there were teachers like uh, Malevich and Rodchenko. You know, so you had these constructivists on the one hand, and you had Florensky talking about more abstract things. And he wrote a very, very famous, well, essay, if you like, or small book called Reverse Perspective, which was came from the icons and the idea that instead of perspective going away, and in is it would go out and there were i mean a whole that's a very simplified explanation there's much more much more to it than that and of course he would say to things like this to Yudin, he'd say Yudina maria Veniaminovna, it's time you um studied the golden mean and applied it to music <laughs> because uh, his mathematical principles so there were a lot of things that were very important um in in that um when and, and you, Maresky, mentioned, you mentioned Solovki earlier and he, he yeah. in fact disappears into into that underworld that, he? he was arrested twice um he was arrested the second time arrested the first time for a, in 1928 but not for very long and then he was arrested in 1933 and he disappeared Yudina, as soon as her friends were arrested, 
And this happened largely in 1928-29, when the, I mentioned the philosophical circle um, Voskresenie, which means either Sunday or resurrection, and which Bakhtin was a member, um, you know, all the important intellectuals of the university in, in Leningrad, Petrograd, were members, and they were all arrested. For some reason, Eugenia wasn't arrested. Nobody can quite tell why. But uh, anyway, the, I will ask you um, later about your theories about that. Um. <laughs> and what happened is that she then started going and making supplications. She would go and ask people. She managed to burst into the chief prosecutor's office, a man called Kirilenko, I think he was called, and say, you know, you have to do something about this person. And she would manage to get their sentences reduced. She was a great friend of um, Ekaterina Peshkova. Who, and now this is something I didn't even realize that she belonged to the Russian Red Cross Peshkova and she was the first wife of Maxim Gorky, the writer. And she single-handed, she got this thing up called Pom Polit, which was Pomish Polit. Uh, politicism zaključonom or something. So, in other words, help to political prisoners. Um, and so, when because she had been a friend of Lenin, they kind of took notice of her. So, somebody would be arrested in the Lubyanka and taken and tortured and the rest of it. And she, in her offices around the corner, would go and say, You've got to let them go. You've got to let them meet their family. You've got to let them. And she succeeded a lot until about 1935 and 1934. And she no longer had the power to do that. But for, and she, together with Yudina, did a lot to make sure that Bakhtin was not sent to Sadatki. He was meant to go, but they got that sentence reduced to exile in Siberia. Um, similarly, she tried to uh, influence the outcome for Florensky. Um, the first arrest, maybe it helped, but the second arrest, unfortunately, it didn't. But because of that, she wanted to play for Gorky, and she went to play for Maxim Gorky, thinking he would have the influence to, to make sure that the sentence was reduced or in some way liquefied. I, anyway. I have to underline for uh, some of uh, some of our listeners today that that was an incredibly courageous thing is an understatement uh, to to petition on behalf of these uh, people that were uh, considered uh, harmful by the by the regime. This is not like petitioning anywhere else at most other times. So of course, of course. Been, the final one for her and it's i mean it's like a bit like reading you know when you read the story about anna akhmatova and how she came to wrote, write the requiem and she, uh yudina wanted to find the arrested wife of fyodor andreev her the priest who became her confessor and she said you had to go to every prison with a parcel and they would say um no nobody of that name here and you knew they weren't in that prison. And only when a parcel was accepted did you know you'd find the right person. And this is a wonderful description that Anna Akhmatova gives of standing in the prison, the Kresti prison in Leningrad, when she was looking for her son and her husband. Um, but you realize how this affected masses of people, hundreds of people, their families, and you know what, what bitter pill it was. Not only do you lose your a loved one who's arrested, you have no idea if he's alive or dead, you have no idea where he is, what's happening. And in the case of Florensky, he started off by being going to um, Siberia, the eastern Siberia, where he worked as a researcher in the permafrost he worked in. And then at a certain point, he was um, taken from there and taken off to Solovki. And even there, he was doing arrest on the extraction of iodine from seaweed. Um, and then from there, he was taken to Leningrad and shot. But the family didn't know for years what had happened. Was he alive? Was he dead? And um, this is 
one of the things that Eugenia felt very, very strongly. So her concerts were often, if you like, laments for these people. They were also for ordinary people and they were for everybody. But um, behind, I think, one of the strong feeling of that, that she was endeavoring to say something much beyond the score, it was much beyond religion. It was a kind of mixture of everything together and which make her performances very, very singular and very touching, very, very strong. Yes, yeah, so, so maybe before we get into different branches of her um, activities as a, as, a, as a pianist and as a uh, musician, maybe it is time to ask you the question, um, what is your theory? Why was she uh, allowed to, to continue, allowed to survive when so many uh, people that were much less outspoken, much less openly spiritual and religious and did not read uh, uh, dissident uh, poetry out loud to their audiences and so on and so forth, all the things that she did. Um, many of those people were um, uh, sent to the camps. She manages to uh, not be directly harmed. Do you think it's a fluke? You have reasons that you think this is um, uh, this was the case, uh, and some explanations, or we can't. Um, I I don't know about finding a, a logical explanation any more than you can find a logical explanation why some people were arrested. They'd done nothing, you know, they, and there was enough, uh, you know, maybe somebody else breathed uh, or wanted to live in their flat, which was bigger than, you know, theirs. It could simply be a, a horrible reason like that. But um, in Eugenia's case, um, there's some people who think because she was a kind of euro divu, this yes, term, this Russian term. Of of a, Can you explain uh, in Western words, what is a euro divu? <laughs> it's a uh, well if you like it's a fool it's um we have them in shakespeare as well the fool can say to the king what he wants and he isn't punished um the eurodivi is tends to be a holy fool as in the the opera boris godunov we all, all remember godunov how the eurodivi comes and asks for his copic and he tells um, bodies, what he thinks, and he is not punished. Um, it's possible because Udina was very direct. She didn't bother not to, she could say things. But at the, uh, having said that, um, you know, I'm looking at all the archives and think she was very careful, actually, when, for instance, she was thrown out of the Leningrad Conservatoire for being religious. Um, but she actually was careful not to speak to her students about religion. She never denied being religious. And they would say, what do you think of the Communist Party? She said, well, I think it's a, a good thing. And I would like, if I had more time, to be able to contribute. But I don't think I can, uh, I can do that. Also, I'm religious. She never denied being religious. and she, But she didn't make a thing about it, and she never was a propagandist because she knew that that would be um, um, dangerous for people. So, so that's sorry. I'm just going to turn this off. So, um, but why was she not arrested? It's impossible to tell. Really, impossible. I mean, I think the Rodeo explanation is very is is it seems quite quite convincing, and that. Um, but of course, many, many Eurodivis and many spiritual people that emanated something that uh, would command respect, uh, you know, were, uh, of course, uh, of course, eliminated. But it's, uh, it is a marvel that she could. It, is, it was. She was in disgrace a lot of the time. So, for instance, in 1930, she was thrown out. As I said, there was this horrible article in the newspapers about being a, a nun on the, on, on the, in the faculty. <laughs> and um, you know, the invective there is really ghastly when you read it, it's horrifying. And at the same time, they called a meeting and they, uh, of the staff. And the, you know, a lot of the professors there, the Steinberg, the professor of composition, or 
um, Sherbachev, uh, her own piano teacher. They kind of try to defend her very, or they say, well, perhaps she could just do a little bit of, um, you know, um, sort of work on her political <laughs> um, education and she, she'll understand better. But, you know, the, they would never, of course, have, have uh, said anything actually against her. Um, and the people who were speaking against her were not musicians. They were bureaucrats, party administrators. They were people with no understanding of what art is. But she had her public. She had an enormous following in the public. And I think she also knew a lot of very important uh, Western musicians, because if you remember in the 1920s, all the great conductors were still going to the Union, uh, Soviet Union. Klemperer, um, Bruno Walter, uh, um, Schnabel, the pianist, went. Um, there would have been an outcry if, if uh, Udin had been arrested because it would have been noticed. Um, and she was very friendly, for instance, with Klemperer, although she didn't play with him. Fritz Stiedri, who was the um, chief conductor for a while of the Leningrad Philharmonic. He was a close friend and they played a lot together. Um, so I think there was also the feeling we better not touch her because it'll be terribly embarrassing in the West and they'll, they'll make a fuss and, you know, and whereas if we arrest some lot of people, nobody knows who the hell they are. They're just some engineer or some, and we'll say they were doing sabotage or whatever. You know, how can you say a musician is doing sabotage? It's not very easy to do that. Yes. Um, and, uh, so we spoke a little bit about uh, her, so the philosophical religious connections uh, that she that she had. Uh, of course, her connection with uh, uh, with Pasternak is uh, is famous and something that you uh, mentioned even in the description uh, of uh, of our conversation that that he considered mm -hmm. her to be uh, a most discerning uh, reader. So uh, can we talk about her literary circle as we as we circle her musicianship? Can we talk about her the circle yes. of her literary connections? I think it's um, she always loved poetry and uh, you know from the beginning whether it was a mystic poet like Solovyov or you know, the, when she was making her own education. But she also loved Klebnikov, who was a very interesting and original poet, a futurist, if you like. And um, she herself, of course, had this big thing about songs. If you were singing songs, you had to sing them in the language people could understand. And for instance, she did a big cycle by Hindemith in the late 20s, the um, what's it called, the Marienleben, which is um, the life of Maria. And they were on Rilke's uh, poetry. And now she managed to get a poet called Rostjesinski, a well-known poet, to make a translation of this whole cycle. And she gave a couple of performances of it. She addressed Pasternak in 1929, when he was in Leningrad, asking him to um, make some translation of Rilke for him. He had no idea who she was because she just appeared and he leaves this description to his sister in a letter describing this sort of very badly dressed woman with you know holes in her shoes and darn sweaters and things like that and said you know she asked and I said well, I really haven't got time she said well if if it was a question of you know being published and having money would you then do it and he said, no, no. And anyway, you know, at this time, she said, well, if I offered you the money, and he was sort of amazed, um, you know, that looking at her, how could she possibly manage? Her shoes had holes in them, you know, this kind of thing. So then about a few months later, she went to Moscow. And Pasternak had just been to a recital by Neuhaus, Heinrich Neuhaus great pianist and wonderful person. And he said it was absolutely wonderful. And he went back and they became friends. And Neuhaus said, if you think I'm good, just wait till this lady comes from Leningrad and plays. She's playing next week or next month. Go and hear her. And he went to the concert. And who was it? But it was Yudina, the one he had met. And he, 
And so he wrote her a note saying, I'm terribly sorry, I had no idea it was you. And he gave her a book of Rilke. And then they became enormously close friends. Um, we have to remember that Pasternak was a musician by training. Um, he nearly became a composer and pianist, and he was under Scriabin's influence. And we we then... are to thank Scriabin that we have Pasternak as a writer for his... Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, that's right. Um, I think, um, I mean, his pieces are quite good. Have you heard any of them? They're, they're not yes. bad. Yes, yeah, yeah, but, uh, bad. in fact, uh, one could make a whole little program or half a program with, uh, with uh, mus musical works by, by Russian literary uh, literary figures, uh, yes. Anyway, um, as I say, they became close friends and Yudina wanted him to be involved in a big project she had on translating Schubert Lieder. Um, she got into Schubert. She was always not only teaching piano, but she was very interested in vocalists and vocal chamber music, as she called it. So um, at a certain point, she stopped teaching piano. Um, because she was thrown out of the Leningrad Conservatoire. And then in 1936, she came to the Moscow Conservatoire, originally to teach piano, but also to teach vocalists. And she got into this project. So she asked Pasternak, please, will you translate some of um, Goethe and Heine and Schiller, whatever it was, for these songs? Um, he said, well, I can't do it at the moment. I'm very busy translating Shakespeare. I can't do it now. And then after the war, he did do some of it. But first he said, um, I've just been writing this thing for myself. Um, um, I could come round and uh, read it to you. And so she invited to her flat about 20 people or 25 people. And he came and read the first chapters of Dr. Zhivago, which was then, of course, complete. Nobody knew that he was doing it. And nobody knew he was writing a prose work. and. And it was amazing. And of course, it's a prose work with these wonderful poems at the end. And Yudina was absolutely bowled over by it. And she wrote him wonderful letters in which she can see she goes right to the heart of the matter and can understand the beauty or the importance of a particular poem. Her favorite was Rozhdesinskaya uh, Zvezda, The Christmas Star, which is a lovely poem about the nativity, one of the Zhivago poems. Um, letters, by the way, for our listeners, are these are some of the Eugenia letters? I know they're published in Russian, but um, are some published in in uh, in Western languages? And are you translating some of them in your book? Uh, well, I should start by saying there are already seven big, thick volumes of letters. I mean, I'll show you. That are translated into English? No, they're in Russian. Yeah, this I know that in Russian they're published. But you no. know that. I'm showing your, your listeners just to say that that is only 1959 to 1961. There are about 800 pages of letters. So you can imagine <laughs> that very few people are going to translate um, seven volumes. And an eighth volume is now being prepared in Russia. So the, they found a lot more letters. And that's thanks to Alexei Lubimov and Marina Drozdova who are two wonderful people who are uh, both pianists and both wonderful musicians. Oh, no way, Mr. And... Mr. Dimov is, is present as we speak, so. <laughs> well, in that case, I sent him all my love and, and admiration because um, these letters, which uh, it's an extraordinary story that what Yudina left behind because she not only left behind an enormous literary um, articles and fragments of things and all these letters but she left behind devoted people and there was a fantastic man called Anatoly Kuznetsov who collected all her letters interviewed everybody there is a mass of material in Russian about Yudina unfortunately um, I don't think that it's going to be possible to translate it all into say a language like English because it's too obscure in a way. You could do a selection. But um, what has happened, and there's a particularly important correspondence, which is between, um, we're talking about later on, Pierre Suvchinsky, uh, who was, uh, lived in Paris, but was of Russian origin, 
and he was an incredibly important figure in the musical life. Uh, he was a great friend of Stravinsky, and um, he, well, all his life, he also knew Prokofiev very well. And in the 19, early 50s, he was very friendly with Boulez and uh, Messiaen, and they formed the... Uh, up teaching Geza Ander some piano, giving some, some yeah. piano to Geza Ander. Exactly. So the Domaine Musical in Paris was founded with Suvchinsky, who always kept slightly in the background. He preferred that um, the other figures were more important. But there is a fantastic correspondence between Yudina and Suvchinsky, which has been published in French. And it's a beautiful book um, done by a wonderful pianist called Jean-Pierre Collot. He um, found a lot of the letters in, the, in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And um, a lot of them were already known, but he found a new cache of letters. And he put together a book in which you have this correspondence, Yudina and Suvchinsky, which is fascinating because um, Piotr Suvchinsky would tell her about musical life in Paris and give her addresses of composers on Stockhausen and uh, Messiaen and whoever you like. Um, and then she would tell about life in Moscow. So they were exchanging information from two completely different musical worlds, both very interesting musical worlds. And um, she became in the, well, this started, I think, in 1959. She received the contact through Pasternak, who was a friend of Suvchinsky. And of course, Prokofiev had been a friend of Suvchinsky. And Suvchinsky had even applied to come back to the Soviet Union in 1936, um, just more or less the time Prokofiev came back. And um, what is interesting is that he wrote the, or put together the text for the 20th anniversary of the revolution, the cantata for the 20th anniversary of the revolution, which originally was called the cantata for Lenin. So uh, that, that, that was, it seems a very strange thing. Um, now, of course, the fate of that cantata was that um, it may have had lots of wonderful texts by Lenin and, and whoever they were, uh, Marx and so forth, but it was never performed in the Soviet Union, in, never in Prokofiev's lifetime. It was too it's, way out, the music. <laughs> he seemed to be involved in almost statistically improbable number of incredibly interesting artistic gatherings, sort of from pre-revolutionary Russia to uh, 1950s, yeah. 60s with Boulez and... Uh, Absolutely, you know, it's, uh, I find it fascinating. Anyway, for those of you who read French, I would highly recommend you buy this book. Um, it's uh, called The um, Correspondence Yudina and Pierre Suvchinsky. Um, and uh, Jean-Pierre Collot has also put in some other letters to various other correspondents, which are kind of on the same theme. And for instance, she corresponded a lot with a musicologist in Germany called Fred Freiburg. Now, he was the man who was interested in music in Nazi Germany, and he wrote a fantastic biography of Furtwängler. He wrote a book called Music and Power. We're talking about the 1960s and 50s, and he helped you dinner a lot. He helped her with material, sent us things. Everybody was helping her. So she became the first person in the Soviet Union, maybe apart from Shostakovich, to have a score of the, you know, of Stockhausen's pieces, of uh, the Marteau Sans Maître by Boulez. You know, she had these incredible things in her home. And her home had nothing else in it except for scores and books. It was virtually... And another thing that I think uh, is worth, worth mentioning uh, to those that are new to you, Dina, is, uh, is how extravagant and non-mainstream her repertoire was for Soviet Union. I mean, in addition to um, the bread and butter of, uh, of, of, of Beethoven and so on and so forth, but uh, uh, the Hindemith and Stravinsky and uh, Alban Berg, all these things that she, um, that she played that were also a very uh, kind of dependent uh, action from from the official line isn't it 
Uh, yes, I mean, it was interesting because her interest in uh, contemporary music went back to the 1920s. And when she was a student herself, she played works by other students. You know, there was a, her friend Hermann Bieck. She played his piano concerto at her diploma exam examination. She played uh, the Schoenberg Opus 19 pieces. She played Hindemith pieces. She played, the, which was contemporary music in the 1920s. She played Prokofiev, of course, um, and was very interested in Prokofiev and became a friend of his. She um, played certain works by Shostakovich, um, but there was a period when nobody could play sort of anything that was either smacked of formalism um, in the, from the mid thirties throughout the 1940s till well after Stalin's death. There was a big taboo on repertoire and the taboo started to lift in the mid fifties. And maybe one of the most important things was the visit of Glenn Gould, to Russia in 1957, when he played a lot of music that had been completely ignored or forgotten. Um, he played a whole evening at the Mali Zal of the Conservatoire in Moscow on the small hall. And he played Kshenik Sonata, the third sonata. And he played Webern and Berg, uh, Webern variations and Berg sonata. Hindemith he played, I think, the third sonata. And he also played Bach, of course, he played parts of the Art of Fugue and the Goldberg Variations. And so that was a revelation. But it was also, if you like, um, a green light. If he could play that to audiences, why couldn't Russian musicians play? Now, Eugenia was the first one to be up there. He did this probably. Night. No, she did it well, well. Hindi you knew already, of course, and that was, but he was by then an older composer. But she got particularly interested in Stravinsky, and she'd already played Lenos um, the, the, for four pianos um, in the 1920s um, with the wonderful choir master Klimov. Um, so, you know, this was all new, but for her, the biggest excitement was having a, a contact because she knew Suvchinsky with Stravinsky, and then she played as much as she could of his music. And I should mention that number two was her, for contemporary music, was Alexei Lyubimov, who was followed in her footsteps and went lots further, but a young pianist who, who when I was a student, you know, we went to hear him because he played all these unlikely things. Because we forget that, you know, you think that contemporary music is suddenly all right, but each performance had to be fought for. It was not so automatic. And the composers at the time, like Volkonsky or, or like um, Denisov, um, Schnitke, Gubadunin, they were all fighting to get their works accepted. It, it wasn't so simple. Absolutely. So, um, Mr. Lubimov certainly has done um, pretty much the most of. of, of of, uh, of, of anybody in that, in that period in a, mar in a mar admirable uh, way. In fact, there's a question uh, from Maria Shukrinska uh, about uh, Ustvolska. The question is, did, did you in the new or uh, have met Galina Ustvolska? Do you know that? I know she knew her because uh, she was friendly with the violinist Mikhail Weiman. And Weiman was the first performer of the violin sonata. And she asked him, now a lot of the time she'd ask to have music, not for herself, but for her students. So she asked Feynman, please send me the Usvolska violin sonata for my students at the Gnesin Institute where she taught chamber music. Um, I don't know that she actually met her, maybe Alexei would know that, but I, I, I'm not sure. But she knew her, who she was and she knew her music uh, or some of her music. Very, very interesting. Maybe should we should we hear just a little bit of uh, of of music for um, for our ears? And um, uh, if we were on the subject of um, Stravinsky, should we hear a little bit of her playing the serenade or the sonata? Which do you prefer? I know you choose. You choose. Well, we were earlier we were discussing the the serenade. So let us hear a little bit of uh, Maria Yudin playing her uh, friend uh, pen pal, 
Stravinsky, uh, Stravinsky's Serenade in A. So maybe we'll we'll stop stop there for for now. Um, this is uh, you just heard Maria Yudina play the first movement of uh, Stravinsky's uh, Serenade. And in fact, you saw you saw a photo there. And um, maybe now that we have Elizabeth to guide us, um, can you? Uh, talk to us a little bit about what we see on the photos of you in different stages of uh, of life. I'll bring up our little slideshow again, and uh, would be good to hear you comment on it a little bit. Obviously, there's a picture of Stravinsky um, there. Well, the last picture, there she is at the this exhibition. She now we have to remember that uh, Stravinsky had been a, left Russia before the First World War. And he wasn't very keen on Soviets and didn't appear to want to go back at all. But as things got a little bit better in the so-called Thor years, he started uh, have renewing contacts with people like Yudina. Uh, and um, he expressed a desire to come to visit the country. And he came for his 80th birthday in uh, 1962. Um, Yudina, I, I had a letter from Robert Kraft um, saying that Yudina was more responsible than anybody else for his return because um, he didn't want to let her down. She was playing his works wherever she could and she was trying her best to promote his music because she wanted people to know this wonderful genius. Um, there was the first theatre in the Soviet Union 
since the 1920s to put on his ballets was uh, so-called Malégot, the small theatre um, in Leningrad. And she um, helped them, if you like, um, by choosing a, a, a triple bill of ballets. So they did Petrushka and Firebird, which of course got done all the time everywhere. And she said, you have to do Orpheus as a third ballet. And that was through her. She at the same time said, I would like to do an exhibition for you um, when he comes. Um, the exhibition in the end was done for the Union of Composers in Leningrad. And she put together this extraordinary um, exhibition with his whole life and all the works. And what's more, she got photographs from everywhere and she would write all over the world to get scores and photos. And she wrote to Balanchine to get him to send the photos of his productions. And um, she spent a lot of money, actually, of her own money. Um, and she never, she was in debt for about two years afterwards because the, she, in order to, um, in order to is it like pay for things being sent from abroad, she would send them beautiful books about icons or Moscow, whatever it would be, from the Soviet Union, spent a lot of her own money. Um, and Stravinsky came and here he is, this is her night of glory, and she is showing him around the exhibition. And he was very, very touched because she found a lot of things about his father, uh, who was a singer at the Marinsky Theatre, and a lot of things about his early life that he had forgotten. Um, she also got to know his uh, niece. He had one living niece in Leningrad, and that was a great success. They got to know each other. Um, there are a few questions that uh, that I want to insert from, from our participants. There's, um, there's uh, Joseph Horowitz, uh, is a wonderful cultural historian and writer. He says, uh, adds, Seymour Lipkin played Stravinsky's Concerto for Piano and Winds with Bernstein and yeah. New Harmonic in Russia in 1959. I know this piece was a specialty of Eudinus. Had she already played it at USSR at that time? And I know that she um, recording. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, um, later. She was going to play it. She was going to play it in the 1930s. She learned it then. And then they couldn't get hold of the material. This is a big problem for the Soviets, is that um, higher material from Western publishers was too expensive for them. To, and they would normally get hold of a score and get somebody to copy out parts. But anyway, she was unable to to um, play the concerto for for wind, piano, winds, and percussion on that in the 1930s. But she had learnt it. And um, so she was devastated because she had to play instead Rachmaninoff's second concerto. So <laughs> she thought Rachmaninoff was terribly retrograde and she was a bit ashamed of that. And the here, only work here we get to actually like. another question that, that was uh, hanging from much earlier, but now is the time to insert it from, from uh, um, wonderful pianist and friend Vadim Holodenko. He was asking, uh, um, did Judina like the playing of Svetoslav Richter? And then Jan Henrik Amberg adds, concerning the question raised here about Judina's attitude to the playing of Svetoslav Richter, I understand that their relations were not good. It would therefore be interesting to hear if that was a musical ground or rather a personality issue. Um, um... Let's say uh, it's a bit complicated, this question, because obviously Eudina must have had sort of had an admiration for him. She couldn't deny who he was. She was a bit jealous of him, maybe. And she would refer to him quite disparagingly as you know, the tenor or something. You know, he, she thought he wanted to have success too much. Um, she was very annoyed with him when they had the, um, a lot of pianists went down for Pasternak's funeral. Um, in the beginning of June in 1960. And they, there was a piano in the house because Stanislav Neuhaus, a pianist, lived in the Pasternak house in Peridil, you know. So they took it in terms and Yudina played and Stanislav Neuhaus played and Andrei Volkonsky played. And then suddenly Richter turns up and he monopolized the piano and didn't let any of them have another go. And she was furious. She said, well, how could you be so selfish, you know, and so egotistical? So um, you'll find references to him in the letters to Suvchinsky. 
So I think there was a kind of love-hate relationship between them. I mean, she will know, have known him through their friendship with Neuhaus and through, um, and through their, um, through, and through their friendship with Pasternak. And Richter's remarks about her that are printed in the diaries are also a little bit equivocal <laughs> because um, um, he would say it's terribly tiring to go to a concert of Judith as it's so intense all the time. Or, but he'd also say she was amazingly talented and she, um, she did a fantastic job on this and that. For instance, the Schubert B flat sonata, which is a very, um, if you like, um, thorny question of how she plays it. For some people it's absolutely beautiful, for some people it's impossibly unlike what the composer indicated in the score. Um, and she starts extremely slowly. Now, we always thought that Richter was very slow in that particular sonata, the opus posthumous B flat sonata. The difference is that Richter isn't actually as slow as Eugenia. She's slower at the beginning, but he maintains a slow tempo and it just goes on in slow tempo, whereas she, her tempo is very flexible and fluctuating and uh, it's. I find it more interesting myself than, than him, but that's my opinion. Yeah. By um, the way, uh, I don't think they could have liked each other in in that sense. They were too different. Since we were since we were before uh, also talking about Sufchinsky, and I found a letter that uh, you are likely aware of, uh, but um, some of our readers might not be from Sufchinsky to Eugen. And if I should try to translate it um, from 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 Russian now, this is in. Uh, end of December 1962, and Sufchinsky writes to Eugene that this time managed to hear and understand uh, Richter. Uh, he, of course, is a phenomenon, man, musician, pianist, unlike anyone else, and his vol voltage is unusually high. It is, as it were, surrounded by high, he is, as it were, surrounded by high voltage currents. This is his strength and exceptional originality. But by this, he defends himself from afar from everything around him. And I'm afraid that it's precisely this inherent magnetic zone that at the same time isolates him from everything that should be necessary and useful to him, which is uh, a <laughs> harsh criticism, but, uh, but, um, uh, but rather, um, well, rather interesting. It's certainly interesting. I think also he defended himself from Yudina because she wrote to Subchinsky saying, I will be very jealous if you go to Richter and get to know him. Because she, was, she knew he was a, a, a very interesting man. After all, he had his own um, literary world, his own artistic world. He was a, painted himself. And you, know, he, you couldn't say he was just another pianist. There was no way you could say that. And, um, and in fact, while, uh, while we were listening to um, Stravinsky uh, being played by, uh, by Yudina, I um, uh, texted uh, here with, uh, with Mr. Lubimov, who said that he would actually uh, kindly agree to um, say a few things about, as he says, some important persons uh, studying Yudina's archives. So let's see if this will actually uh, work. I'm not sure if he wants to just speak in voice or in video, but we'll try with with voice first. And um, let's um, let's see if uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Lubimov will. I, I tried. I'm trying to be connected. Yes. Would you like? Can I put you on video? Oh, why not? If you want. Yes, we'd love to see you. So uh, in a second, he'll rejoin as a panelist, and then if all goes ah ah yes, uh, and yes. now what should I do? Click um, to this. If you start your camera, then we should be able to even see you, not only. Uh, I I don't know how to to, to do the camera. On the it, left side. Uh, it's on the bottom left. You'll see there's a stop and start video, a little thing that looks like a video camera, and then oh there no. we. Go. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to see you first, <laughs> Elizabeth. Great. I'm very happy and, to see you. I, 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 I like to, to, to know you finally. <laughs> in, in, in person, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you met some sometime. I think in Delft we met once some years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah probably. 
literally in a different lifetime by now, especially since the pandemic. Yeah, uh, I, I, I see a big reflection in my uh, reflections from my glasses. It's not okay. disturbing to you. It's, it's a joy to see you. <laughs> okay, so I would like to first uh, to, to thank uh, everybody um, for listening to this and especially the, tell, uh, the telling uh, of uh, Lisa, of Elizabeth. And you mentioned also Seymour Likkin, play, uh, who played performed, uh, first in Soviet Union in 1959 uh, with um, uh, uh, Stravinsky's concerto. I was present at this concert, uh, at this concert, and I have seen seen Yudina not yet, but I have seen um, uh, Bernstein and Lipkin. And finally, uh, it's it's so interesting. Uh, I have discovered a letter of Lipkin to Yudina uh, recently. Uh, it was um, uh, it it was preserved in her archives in 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 uh, um, the uh, library, in Moscow library. And now we are going to uh, to publish this letter. And I have written to uh, two important archives in, uh, in, 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 in the States, uh, to library of Juilliard School and library to Curtis uh, Institute, uh, in the hope to find Eugenius letters there because uh, um, Lipkin's archives are both in these uh, uh, schools. Well, and uh, Joe Horowitz, who is who is still still with us, I think uh, might also be uh, a useful contact to, to help you in that in that part of the research. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, but I would like to men to mention um, is um, after the. Uh, before Elizabeth has uh, has uh, begun uh, her fantastic work, and he ha she has shown us uh, the one of or two volumes of this collection of letters of Yudina's letters, I have to to mention Anatoly Kuznetsov. Absolutely. Yeah, who was a biographer and uh, a close friend uh, in the last year years of Yudina and of course um, of uh, Marina Drozdova um, and uh, Kuznetsov's family and family of Marina Drozdova uh, took care about every, everything um, concerning Yudina's letters and, no, and music scores and archives and finally these two archives um, uh, were uh, put in um, most in two in two uh, big archives in the uh, National Library, uh, uh, Lenin Library in Moscow, and in Glinka Museum in Moscow. And uh, thanks to Kuznetsov, uh, there were two. Uh, there were these um, uh, uh, these volumes published during twelve, uh, ten or twelve years uh, of seventy-eight. Uh, uh, he died uh, in two. Yeah. 1978 until 2010, yeah. 2010, yeah. And he, yeah. Uh, this, uh, and he died uh, exactly in this year. And um, last volume was uh, published after his death. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, we could continue uh, his uh, great job uh, collecting letters and other materials to publish uh, so-called eighth volume, uh, which is planned for this year. That's, that's wonderful. And on the, on the, on the personal note, uh, and forgive me mm -hmm. that I don't know this better, but um, how much contact were you able to have with you in a personal in your in your? Uh, uh, this story, I don't know if it's interesting for most people. Um, I was uh, fourteen or fifteen when my uh, school. Uh, great school teacher Anna Artobolevskaya in the Central Music School uh, and, um, entered me to Yudina because she was a pupil of uh, Yudina in, uh, in uh, 1925, I, I think she came to Kiev. I think in Kiev, in Kiev, but in Kiev, yes. Yeah. And later, uh, uh had always uncut contact uh, with unbroken contact with Yudina during her life um, and 
and she entered me to Udine she, uh, she, um, because I, ha I was so interested on contemporary music uh, from my youth. Uh, and she felt uh, uh, Udine will, uh, will remain for me just right person. And um, uh, shortly, uh, I, I was one of uh, most young people around Udine, uh, near her. Uh, great students, um, uh, Viktor Derevianko and Marina Drozdova. With uh, them, he ha uh, she has played a lot, and I was sometimes turning turning scores, turning pages um, at the rehearsals. But later, um, I think it mid sixties, uh, uh, but she she was. Uh, she has invited me to meet Stravinsky in 62 in Sheremetyevo, and it was a big honor for me. And I was uh, um, uh, staying with her and see, seeing how, how uh, she and other people um, welcomed Stravinsky. And she was uh, so uh, devoted to, to, to him completely. And after I was, I, I try, I, I has try, I have tried to imitate even her um, interpretations of Stravinsky playing after her in the school Stravinsky's concerto and some other other later some other works, and uh, other uh, close contacts results of these contacts were uh, she uh, she permitted me to take. Um, very um, um, very important, very necessary scores from her. Uh, there were um, uh, autograph of Volkonsky Musica Stricta and Weber Variations. And I have copied this, this both works in just one night uh, 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 from, from uh, her um, copies, from her exemplars with many uh, Corrections, not uh, uh, corrections, but with many remarks. And later, after mid 60s or end 60s, uh, I began to play. Uh, I, I, I have got to per, uh, the permission from her and uh, began to, to play after her as, as the first. Um, uh, and uh, one uh, very small, maybe um, small detail uh, in 64. Um, I was exactly 20, uh, yes, exactly 20. She um, was invited, um, she was, uh, she, she became uh, an offer from Moscow Radio to record Mikrokortos of Bartok. And she decided to share a uh, chromatic invention of Bartok from Mikrokortos with me um, for two pianos. But at the same time, she she uh, told me she has no time for all pieces from from the fifth and sixth volumes, and she decided to to divide in two parts. One part I have recorded, and uh, another bigger part she has recorded uh, for Moscow Radio. It was uh, a great uh, experience to be with her and to um, to uh, to have just one. Uh, small recording with her. Amazing, amazing. And uh, um, I think before, and also we'll uh, let Elizabeth continue her discourse, but I wanted to ask Elizabeth this question. And since we have the fortune of, of having you here as well, um, if I may ask, let's say, a general uh, question, how, what is your view or assessment of you, Dina, especially in this landscape of um, Russian and Soviet pianism. So we have uh, Richter and Gilels and uh, so all these renowned figures, but she's obviously very special. How do you, um, how do you see her in this, in this context of the, of the piano history of that period and of that place and her, well, and her way of playing? I think Alyosha should 
answer this. He's well, I would love stuff. both of you. I got a pen. <laughs> and, and we have, maybe uh, and maybe we, we have to come. We do have uh, Mr. Derivanko as well, who is very welcome to raise a hand. And then oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah. And like also, uh, I, would I would recommend also to connect with Marina. She is also uh, watching us. Ah, oh, fantastic. Marina Drazdova. I'm not sure that yeah. I have her name in the list unless she is uh, unless she is under some other name. Um, but in the meantime, while we while I try to to locate uh, these people in our uh, list of participants, um, uh, I would love both of you to speak about this. So um, now we get to the center of the mus of the musical uh, discussion. So um, what is uh, her Mm, profile uh, musically for you in contrast to the rest of what is happening in the Soviet uh, pianism at the time? I can say one thing, which I, I'll say first very quickly, that um, you, Dina, you know, she never traveled abroad. She only went to East Germany. She went to Leipzig for the um, 1950, for the Bach celebrations. And she was allowed to go to Poland in 1954, but she never went to the West. She never went. She, unlike uh, pianists like Gillis and Richter and many others, um, she never became known in the West. She never appeared there. And that was an enormous difference um, and one which maybe she resented, but uh, at the same time for her, it wasn't her reality, if you like. She knew where her reality was. And, you know, there were many wonderful pianists uh, in the Soviet Union who weren't as famous as Richter and Gilles, but you, know, you had people like Feinberg and you had people like Rosa Tom Tomarkina. You had wonderful pianists uh, who were not at all well known outside uh, Russia. I don't know. Sofranitsky, of course, another one who went to Paris in the right. 1920s, but he never went abroad again. Or he, I think he went to Tehran with. Um, with, with Stalin and played for Roosevelt, but that was kind of, you know, you don't count that as a concert career. Um, so the, um, yeah, it's, it's a very strange situation. And, and at home, you had people who adored Sofranitsky and who adored Yudina and didn't want to hear about Gilles or Richter. And there was a kind of division of public. Am I right? Me, Alyosha. Uh, yes, um, uh, her difference from from the from almost all the others was, I think, uh, she was a um, thinker, she, she was a philosopher, and she was, um, uh, despite of uh, uh, Richter was also a man of culture of a very broad um, intellectual world, but uh, he never tried at that time. Uh, uh, until very big, uh, until mid eighties, he never tried to to to, to perform some uh, so-called new music. So to uh, uh, to discover an uh, uh, unknown worlds, and Yudina was so advanced, so keen, so always in her six, uh, uh, 50, 60s, she was uh, a pioneer. And she was uh, real, uh, really the first one uh, who broke, uh, has broken the borders, uh, not only in the music, in the performances uh, with new music, but he, he, she broke the borders uh, of herself because she was very, very much bound to to old culture, to to uh, to the tradition. To she loved um, uh, um, um, traditional music, um, even such composers uh, like Shaporin or um, um, or Denisin. <laughs> uh, uh, for instance, uh, she or Denisin or Sviri later yeah. Sviridov uh, were in her list of play of of composers, uh, but. Immediately, uh, when she discovered um, Stravinsky first, Stravinsky, and then with the help of Stravinsky again, uh, Stockhausen, Boulez, and with the help of um, uh, Volkonsky, a new 
uh, directions in new Soviet music, she immediately tried to, to make this music now. Uh, um, I have heard f uh, f uh, f names of Denisov and Sylvester just from her. And she was first to know this. And she, she was full of energy of fire uh, or fire to make propaganda for ev everybody um, who seemed for her really a, a new, new world, new, uh, new sign. And um, I think nobody from other performers or composer or pianists, pianists uh, has done like this. Um, with exceptions, exceptions maybe of very young people like uh, the same Mikhail Weiman who was contacted with Ustvolskaya has played not only Ustvolskaya's violin sonata but other pieces or uh, Rajdestinsky of course uh, but she was uh, she was um, white uh, how to say Bela Varona <laughs> a white crow but you white, we white crow uh, on the on the horizon <laughs> or over the pianistic horizon and she never tried to 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 be to to, to be the, the same as others she she always underlined um, so uh, i do um, the um, She's unique. <laughs> the music, yes, well, I, the, I think you make it sound. The, the rest, the rest are the rest are simple pianists. Yes, she was. She I, was, I, was the intellectual want... this one. It seems uh, from perhaps from the from this rather glorious list of pianists. I wanted to add to Alyosha's um, uh, Alexei's list. Um, she had an absolute faith in Arvo Pert. Um, yeah. She had never heard any of his music and she already decided he was a genius. She had a kind of intuition. For instance, she didn't hear Glenn Gould when he came to Moscow, but she kind of knew at once, oh, there is Victor. <laughs> um, but she knew that um, needs to be uh, that Glenn Gould was a genius. And she, she said that Glenn Gould obviously had been through a lot of suffering. Uh, she believed he had had polio, but he, he had a spinal injury, injury when he was young, and she thought this was very, um, very significant. That that because of having suffered, he would obviously play like a in a special way. Um, and with Arvo Pert, she somewhere mentioned she said, Arvo Pert, you will be like Shostakovich. She didn't mean that he'd write music like Shostakovich, but that he would have the the authority and the big name that Shostakovich had. And we have uh, also uh, Mr. Dryanko with us. So we have an amazing uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, assembly here and also even people that, that actually knew uh, uh, Maria Yudina and if I, I played with her. <laughs> you studied, you studied chamber music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. First of all, very nice to see uh, Alosha, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Kirill. It's uh, very pity, not, not yet uh, Marina Rodova, but uh, it's a very, very beautiful uh, initiative. <laughs> initiative. And um, very interesting to, to hear uh, all the uh, all what is said about Yudina, uh, also Elizabeth, and also uh, Alyosha Lubimov. Uh, I was I was very lucky because I was a student of Yudina, and uh, not only student, but uh, very close to all the family of Eugenia and uh, my mother was uh, also, she worked with Eugenia a lot of, a lot of time. And uh, also I was a student of Neuhaus and I, uh, I can, to compare Eugenia and Neuhaus, it's very interesting because it was a lot of difference, of course, but it was also um, much more common than 
we were thinking about it because maybe because uh, also Neugaard also Udina was um, were uh, students of uh, um, uh, how to say Blumenfeld. it uh, this, Blumenfeld. Uh, Blumenfeld, yeah? Blumenfeld Blumenfeld yeah Blumenfeld yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, of course, it's some common, some many, many special common uh, between Yuzna and Nogas to to go to uh, uh, very, very, uh, very inside of uh, of music, like Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann. And uh, Brahms, of course, um, and uh, also um, there is a uh, individuality of uh, Eugene and and Neuhaus. Uh, and uh, um, uh, I must say, uh, Eugene uh, very like uh, Neuhaus, very very, and uh, Neuhaus was. In, a little bit uh, suspicious about Eugene because Eugene was a Eurodive like it, it was said. And um, sometimes uh, he uh, said me, uh, played uh, play, um, individually, but, but not like Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, I, can I say something about Victor? Because Victor has left with you, Dina, some wonderful recordings. Um, Bartok, uh, Sonata for two, for two, yeah, exactly. So, so that yeah. for two pia I pianos and, and Stravinsky Concerto for two pianos. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I must say we played a lot of, of uh, in all the, uh, Old Russia. Uh, we played uh, a lot of uh, on the Caucasus and Baltica, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, also in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, but I must say, uh, how was it? Um, um, how was made? Uh, this uh, Bartok and Savinsky rehearsal before before the, the, the not rehearsal before the uh, uh, recording before recording yeah. if they recorded before recording yeah uh, our um, percussions uh, players um was uh, they were from uh, Russian ghost, uh, ghost orchestra and of course was very busy and uh, all the rehearsal was uh, around these two two men and um, at midnight <laughs> Uden, uh, made uh, 30 rehearsals in this uh, this um, ensemble with uh, Sigirov and Nikula, uh, 30. <laughs> you understand what is this uh, now um, with uh, one rehearsal but, but, um, before the performance, one or two. And now it's 30. Can I mention uh, Vitya? I, I read that. Um, the oopsie. Oh, he what? just uh, sometimes. I, 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 I can remember. I can, I can remember just one one small detail from from one of this rehearsal. Uh, Vita, Victor, I was yeah. turning turning pages uh, in one in rehearsal. With Bartok or Stavinsky? With Bartok. With Bartok. Bartok. And you, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you and, and you and Maria Yudina uh, have least, uh, have um, uh, um, played. I think it was for the first time you, you have played. Uh, you played uh, just uh, um, 
second oh, movement. Se second movement. And and Eugene uh, has have uh, has played uh, these famous glissandos um, uh, in in a false. Yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Instead, yeah. instead of yeah. bass key, she, she, what, she uh, in, that would like uh, to play the glissando. Yeah, yeah, of, and, of, and and you and and, and you uh, very, you you are, and you are to, uh, very to very play nice. key, uh, her glissando. Yeah on yeah. our uh, second, second piano and mm -hmm. uh, I did it and also in uh, in the mm -hmm. recording. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Um. Yeah, and also it was very, uh, very um, funny. We made a rehearsal in the nation's um, uh, academy and um, big hall was uh, uh, in the top, and we uh, made the rehearsal with the um, first first uh, level, first uh, first floor, um, it, uh, first floor. one of uh, for this uh, class on the first first level. Uh, and um, after this, uh, we had uh, rehearsal in Great Hall on the top, and all the instruments, all the um, uh, percussions, uh, we can uh, when uh, we must uh, take Carry them. Uh, Carry with them. us to, to yeah. stop. So uh, <laughs> me and and Stigerov and Nikulin and sometimes Yuzhen uh, also made made it. So it was very funny and very and all the all the rehearsals was like that. But after that, it was very in, in a... very simple to play and and perform. In one of her letters, Yudina complains that yeah. that yeah. this. Um, it complains that it's uh, very expensive because she had to pay six rubles each time for higher percussion. She had to pay it, and the taxis, the transport of percussion. So each rehearsal costs her six rubles, and there were how many? He said thirty rehearsals. Yeah, yeah. So you can multiply it, and she was again having to borrow money mm -hmm. to to cover the debts for that. But, um, but she was she was so. Uh, uh, Keen and so proud about this Bartok sonata uh, and playing with Victor and two percussionists. She in, several times in Lenin, mm -hmm. Leningrad to Tbilisi to I don't know to Kiev probably also I don't know uh, um, and in several places in Moscow she tried to 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 make this sonata um, a, a piece of 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 really great. Uh, it was great achievement for her, and I, I, she tried to, to. It was her dream to propose to Balanchin to to, um, to make ballet. On yeah. Her. Yes. She had some very impractical mm -hmm. ideas because she another idea for a ballet. She wrote to Balanchin and said, "Why don't we do a ballet together and I'll play the thirty-three Diabelli variations?" <laughs> so you can imagine, um, mm -hmm. and the Bartok Sonata, of course, is another yeah. suggestion. <laughs> uh, I think it was very impractical for somebody who was Vuiznaya, uh, near Vuiznaya, somebody who was not allowed to leave the country, to to try and perform with Balanchine's <laughs> New York City Ballet. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely amazing, uh, amazing uh, to hear to hear f uh, really firsthand recollections together with uh, together with uh, with uh, your knowledge and expertise, uh, Lisa. I wanted to ask you about uh, so maybe this your is. Time. Not the most substantial mm -hmm. part of, let's say, um, Please, um, the lore, uh, but in any case, uh, these stories about Stalin. You mentioned one that you also don't believe uh, the story <laughs> about the Mozart concerto. People have seen it now in, in this Death of Stalin movie, popularized in yet yeah. even more unbelievable way. But maybe, maybe talk a little. Well, uh, 
Yeah, you um, I think in the West, I'm, I'm not talking about Russia at the moment, I'm talking in the West, Yudina's name came to people's attention through the book of um, Solomon Volkov, Testimony. The, well, it's called The Memoirs of Shostakovich. Um, anyway, that story is told about how Yudina made a recording over one night for for Stalin because he'd rung the radio saying, um, I want the Mozart concerto by Yudina. And he then, um, the radio didn't dare say, no, we haven't got it. It was a direct broadcast. So they apparently uh, called up an orchestra and three conductors and they produced a, a record overnight. And anyway, let us say that when I went to Moscow, um, and also Alexei helped me in this a little bit and my other friends there and Marina Dalazdova, I, I tortured them all. But I myself went to the radio archives and I wanted to see whether Yudina had played a Mozart A major concerto. And I went through all the archives from all the war years and until I got to the day, the year 1947, which is when that recording was made. And in 1947, suddenly the kind of detailed archives stopped. Um, so you had a, what they call the de um, spisek, um, the, um, what is it? Just, it's the radio, the broadcasters have a list of things going out and it's not at all detailed. It says Mozart concerto. It doesn't say if it's a violin concerto or a piano concerto or horn concerto. You have sometimes Eugene a concert and you sometimes have um, so there were various possibilities where she could have done it. And you, you look at the timing and say, oh, no, that was too short. She couldn't have done that um, and so forth. But basically, it was certainly the case that any possible recording of those ones that were on the list that could have been a Mozart concerto, that it could possibly have been played by Udina and possibly by an orchestra. So it didn't even say if there was an orchestra or not. Um, but the latest one was in May and the recording was made in July. So there was no need for an overnight recording. Let us start with that. Um, the second part of the story of the legend um, was that Stalin sent money to Yudina and she apparently, according to the story, um, gave the money to the church or for the restoration of the church and uh, wrote to thank him and say, we will pray for the forgiveness of your great sins against the people and the country. Well, to start with, Eugenia was not going to church. She was not, um, we already spoke about this earlier, that she had belonged to the part of the church that was a schism. She was offended with the official church and she didn't go to church. She didn't start going to church again until 1956. So, um, she didn't have any connection with a church or, of course, she could have given money away, but I don't particularly believe that. Um, and I also think um, seeing how careful she was when she wrote letters to, for instance, the Conservator or the Genesis Institute, when there was a problem, like she was being accused of being religious uh, and she had to be thrown out, she was always very careful what she said. I don't see that she would suddenly have written such a suicidal letter. And the last thing is that part of the story says that on the day of Stalin's death on 5th of March 1953, they discovered on the gramophone or patophone time turntable, the record of the Mozart A major concerto. Now I didn't go to it, but um, there was a, uh, a lady called Kuznetsova who went to the Stalin Dacha where he died and there was a list of catalogue of all the record records he owned and there was no Mozart concerto and there was no Udina recording so that makes it seem to me there's an awful lot of things that are, don't add up it's not impossible that it's that it's um, some part of the story is true I'm not but I myself am not inclined to believe against it Anybody I've spoken to, and I've spoken to all the people who are connected with her and relation, nobody ever heard the story from Eugenia. And I wrote to Solomon Volkov and asked where, whether he heard the story from Eugenia, because he met her, and he said, no, only from Shostakovich. And just to 
develop that side further, my teacher, Mstislav Rostropovich, who knew Shostakovich pretty well, and of course was a dedicatee of the cello concertos and played various other first performances of his works. Um, he didn't believe it for an instance. He said, you know, uh, Shostakovich loved telling stories. He was a very good storyteller. And if he had one or two vodkas, he would elaborate on the story. And each time the story would be slightly different. And he could make a story. And he would tell these stories, you know, to entertain his friends at, at supper table. And he was a wonderful raconteur on these occasions when he became unbuttoned, as it were. Um, and therefore, I think he, perhaps he did tell the story, but does it mean it's true is another thing. You know, he wasn't trying to record something as a document for history. He was just at a table with, with friends and a nice bottle of vodka and they were having, having a, a good evening. So my inclination is to say it's not true uh, or in part true, but um, it's certainly, you know, it's been taken up because it's so extraordinary. And you see something like the death of Stalin, which is hardly a historical document either, that film. So, um, you know, let's take it with a big pinch of salt, please. And, um, uh, and well, since, since you're here, which is wonderful, uh, and you have written a very uh, important and authoritative book about Shostakovich, and we're talking about a story that perhaps comes from Shostakovich via Solomon Volkov. So I cannot resist and ask you how much you think we should be um, uh, believing uh, the um, texts and retellings uh, that uh, Mr. Volkov has published about Shostakovich. But you can... It's a kind of... Well, no, I can just want to say one thing. Um, I think that Mr. Volkov made a miscalculation, probably, probably, in calling it the memoirs, because people, and he made a miscalculation in that he didn't realize that people in the West are extremely punctilious about things like this. Scholars will go and look it up. And, and an American scholar, wonderful scholar, Laurel Fay, who wrote a biography of Shostakovich, was a person who did the most important research on this. And it's something we all noticed. If you read the book, there are bits that have been published elsewhere in Soviet um, for instance, about Udina, half of the stuff about Udina is already published in an article Shostakovich wrote about Udina and was published in a Soviet music magazine or something. So I think it's been put together quite cleverly. What uh, Volkov heard from Shostakovich is impossible to say. And I'm sure he did do some interviews and did get a lot of interesting material and comment. Um, I think that when I spoke early back, back Maxim Shostakovich said, um, you know the photograph on such and such a page where Shostakovich has written to Solomon Volkov uh, in remembrance of our talks about Zoshinko, um, Akhmatova, I can't remember, the three or four, Glasunov and so forth. They were all people from the 1920s and he was evidently kind of, trying to say to the world, this is what I talked about. These are the people I talked about, because he, he didn't know what he was going to do with it when the book appeared after his death. Um, I think if he'd published the book and said, I have put this book together from conversations I had and from publications that were made, he would have had no problems and there would have been none of this Shostakovich wars. But of course, he chose to say that it was the uh, memoirs. He got, there has been trouble because people are not going to accept that without proof. And Laurel Fay's final proof was finding a typescript and finding that each chapter started with a bit that was published in the Soviet Union. And with uh, on top of it, I have read this Shostakovich, except for the first chapter, but he had inserted three pages at the beginning. So. Uh, <laughs> That, um, that, I think, settles it for me. Uh, but it's not to say that the book isn't worth reading. It certainly is. <laughs> no, that's a, thank you. It's a very informative and nuanced uh, uh, answer, which I think uh, provides a good perspective to, to look at that 
book from. Uh, there is a question that I think would be, uh, I would be amiss not to pass on as well from Boris Benatzdia. Is it possible to talk about Yudina's commitment towards Christian prisoners in gulags? So we talked a little bit about it, but um, I think it's- About Christian- About Christian yeah. prisoners in, in, in gulags. Christian. Uh, well, I could expect, I expect that other people here could talk better about it. Um, I think Marina Drozdova is here. And but she I'm having, if, if Marina Drozdova would uh, send me a chat message because she's not registered under her name. So oh, okay. uh, I would gladly connect her, but I don't know which which name. So if, if she would give any kind of sign or... I, I, I would say myself that there are a lot of people who are prisoners in Gulag, maybe not necessarily because they were imprisoned for being Christian. They might be imprisoned under a different, you know, for some kind of anti-Soviet propaganda from some, you know, they could have been imprisoned for all kinds of reasons. Um, what is amazing is how these people could keep their faith. Um, you know, we know that was it Zadaretsky who wrote 24 preludes and fugues in, in a Soviet gulag. And, and we were talking yesterday about the French pianist born in Torino and Turin, who spent years in the gulag. And then, um, uh, wait a minute, Levon Shevchenko, is that right? I'm, yes, Vera Lovina. Vera, Vera, Vera. Um, so you do get these extraordinary people who, who are able to maintain their spirit and their, um, and their professional career they can, I mean to be able to play the piano after 11 years in the gulag is, is to my mind amazing without an instrument but anyway um, uh, the, there were there were of course many many people who went precisely because they were Christians and we're talking really about the massacres in the church in the 19 late 1920s we have to not forget that the Soviet Union declared itself an atheist state and in 1932 they had a opened a museum of atheism in the in the ex um, uh, cathedral in in Leningrad in the the one in Nevsky Prospect the big one what's it called um, uh, I just, it's, it's slipped my mind anyway um, there's a church built in 1812 for the um, uh, Kazansky Sabor yes. um, that that became the museum of atheism um, and uh, atheism um, was what people um, were meant to believe. But I find that the, one of the most interesting things about writing this book is discovering things like uh, Yavorsky, Boris, um, Boroslav Yavorsky. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. But um, anyway, that he um, was writing his book Bach seminars. He was a wonderful musicologist and very unknown in the West. And he should be, he was of immense importance. There were two musicologists who were really important in the Soviet Union, Solotinsky and Yavorsky. Yavorsky perhaps more so. But people really don't know who they are over here. And even in Soviet Russia, they didn't leave very much um, sort of scholarly works. But one of Yavorsky's principal things was his interest in Bach and Bach as a, a composer who in the well-tempered clavier, in the, he thought the whole thing was an idea of presenting the gospel, uh, the, the Christian gospel and each prelude and fugue represented one particular incident in the gospel, not chronologically because um, obviously the big minor works like the C sharp minor prelude or the B minor prelude in the first book, um, not the preludes, the fugues, are uh, representations of the finish of the crucifixion or of Golgotha or something. But each, each incident, and here he was doing this in 1938 and 1939 in the midst of the most dreadful repression of the church. And people were going to his lectures, people, Marina, Maria Yudina would illustrate them. She was, uh, and you have this extraordinary kind of, uh, how shall I say, uh, contradiction in terms. Similarly, when Bakhtin presented his um, his doctoral thesis in 1946, it was written on uh, Rabelais 
and the uh, idea of carnivalization. Well, the idea of carnivalization was extremely subversive at the best of times, but in Stalinist Russia, to think that in a carnival you can call the king can become the fool and the fool can become the king was a highly dangerous um, concept. And of course, it had great difficulty in getting getting um, through. Eventually, Bakhtin was awarded it. And then many years later, he uh, was able to publish his book in the 1960s, about 66, I think. And the book was formed on the thesis and it was about Rabelais and carnivalization. The person who helped him do this and achieve this doctoral thesis was Yudina. She wrote in the 1940s to everybody who was anybody and found contacts, found examiners who would be sympathetic to Bakhtin. And so when the book came out, Bakhtin said the first copy is for Yudina. She did more than anybody else to make it happen. Well, when she got it, it was a bit of a kind of loaded present because she said, how can I put this book about Rabelais on a shelf with my holy scriptures? <laughs> so, um, but, you know, that is one of the fascinating things about, uh, about Soviet Russia is that many things were happening despite the official um, ideological pressures for things to be like this. And, you know, we talked about... Um, her reciting poetry and things like that. She would not have done that in the 1930s or 40s in a concert, but she could do that in the late 50s and 60s. There was a, there was a this is a photo now of her. Yes, there she poetry. is. Um, addressing the public, of course, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing. But of course, it got her into trouble. She was then not allowed to play in the Leningrad Philharmonic uh, halls. Um, she had problems in Moscow, and the most tragic thing for my mind is that in 1963, she went off to Khabarovsk, you know, you know, right up the far, far, far east of the Soviet Union to play concerts, and she met with students of the music school there, and they asked her questions. She said, I'm very tired, I'm not going to play, but I'll answer questions. She spoke a lot about new music. And um, she then said, um, um, she talked mostly about Western music because it's what people didn't know about, so she thought it would be interesting. And um, she also talked about Volkonsky and said he was a genius and what have you. These teachers, 25 teachers and the head of the school wrote an open letter to the Ministry of Culture and to the newspaper Izvestia denouncing her and saying it was anti-Soviet and what kind of example was this to Soviet youth and you know it was a horrific letter 1963 so we're in the middle supposedly of the thaw we've had every New York Philharmonic we've had um, we've had all kinds of uh, incredible events and yet you have this terrible letter which meant that Udina was not allowed to play at all in any official hall for three years uh, isn't that extraordinary? Yeah, no, this is, um, as you say, as you say, it's absolutely horrific. And um... yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's awful, and it's. Um, I think you can be grateful that you're allowed to play, even if you say something about one of the politicians in one of the countries you live in or have lived in, and I mean. Of course, nowadays nobody going to ask a piano pianist what they think, but um, but if they did, hopefully, yeah, yeah, it remains, and that we don't slip. Maybe perhaps uh, bef before before I uh, let you uh, go because you've dedicated so much of your time so generously already. Uh, we ought to talk about the um, thankfully the kind of posthumous blooming of her um, reputation in the in the West propagated obviously by now through her recordings uh, and uh, and soon uh, even more so uh, thanks to your uh, to your book and hopefully to our uh, gathering here today but um, you've observed it firsthand so to say how her um, posthumous reputation 
has begun to to blossom in the West. So it'd be interesting to to hear you talk a little bit about that. Well, I don't know that I have much more to say than you've already said. I think uh, I think wonderful thing is YouTube. <laughs> Many people, you know, you can go onto YouTube. You can listen to almost all of. Not not quite all of you did this recording, but you and you see a lot of comments and you see that people are really interested and taken by her what she plays. It's not like talking to a concert pianist who studied the same repertoire and say, oh, goodness me, she doesn't do a Ritter Dando here or she does a big crescendo and there's nothing written. They're not people, they're just people who are using their ears and who are their, their hearts are being talked to, if you like they are reacting and that always heartens me um i mean you see some pretty stupid things written but you see a lot of very touching reactions and i think as long as her recordings are getting out to people you know that circle of people is going to grow there's a lot of mystification and sort of false um biographical stuff and we hope that that can be slightly put right by what i write and but but and of course, um, the the enormous amount of work that has been happening in Russia, um, I think maybe some people will in future maybe decide to translate some of it, um, because I think I counted that Anatoly Kuznetsov edited 12 books, 12 big books, five books, five anthologies of things put together and the seven volumes of correspondence. So that's about 100,000 pages. <laughs> it's a lot to read, I can tell you. Um, but it's an awful lot of material that could be taken out and published separately. And you know, people can approach it in different styles. And, and the wonderful book I mentioned um, that's come out in French. And books have come out in Italy, uh, a biography in Italy, and a couple in France. So, so we're in the English speaking world, we're a bit behind. Um, so well, it's wonderful that um, that your book will uh, will uh, more than fix that. And uh, I personally can't uh, can't wait for it. You said there is still a bit of time to wait for it because um, it's not going to be published right right away. But um, uh, no, no. <laughs> um, it's. Hopefully, this time next year, you'll be having it in your hands. I, uh, my publishers have given me a date of January 11th, 2022. Um, we have to also remember that this is all happening during a pandemic and there's an enormous crisis in every um, profession, including publishing. Everything is getting behind, behind, behind. So, um, you know, um, I'm very lucky it's getting published at all. <laughs> Well, so certainly we wait for that. I want to thank you for uh, for for being here with 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 all of us in this in this forum that hosted the Kronberg Academy. Kronberg Academy is um, an incredible place of study, uh, as you know. Uh, string players now also pianists, and originally having these cello roots, and uh, you're a cellist, and perhaps uh, you agree at some point to return and uh, speak about any other subject of your liking, but certainly uh, about uh, your teacher, Mr. Rostropovich, who is also very connected to, um, to Kronberg. Kronberg, of course, yeah. Academy. And just to use a moment of, of time, next week is um, Another fellow cellist that will uh, that will join the, the the seminar, and that's going to be on January twentieth, and it's going to be Stephen Isselis. Uh, ah. Stephen will talk. Stephen will talk about the five uh, Beethoven cello sonatas, as he describes that Beethoven's sonatas for piano and cello embrace the three supposed periods of his creative life, and the first sonatas emerging clearly from his time as a performer virtuoso, last two providing a gateway to his late period, and between comes the most famous of the five, the A major opus 69, with which Beethoven created the genre of an equal duo sonata for the two instruments. So um, hopefully you'll, uh, you, uh, you'll join us then. I will post the um, the registration link in the chat, but also if you go to my website, kirograstan.com and sign up for the newsletter, then you'll receive regular 
updates. And then I thought perhaps we finish by uh, hearing another short little piece by, um, by Maria Yudina, because uh, music does speak better than, than words, if you don't mind. And I thought to, um, to play the early, what seems to be uh, one of her earliest recordings, only one of her earliest recordings of Bach, and this is from 1936. Uh, it's uh, Prelude and Fugue number 14. So a short thing to send us <coughs> up tonight, but I want to thank you very much, Lisa, for for agreeing to come on, and uh, and it was incredible to hear um, recollections and comments from Alexei Lubimov and Viktor Derevyanko. So thank you to everybody, and thank you to everybody that that has taken part for the questions. And um, stay well, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Alyosha. See you all very soon.